Next up, we will hear about digital uh, transformation and driving that digital transformation in manufacturing. Manufacturing industry leaders are creating competitive advantages by unlocking new markets and creating sustainable customer success. While each company's transformation strategy is obviously unique to them, most are anchored by finding new ways to optimize operations, employees, engage customers, and transform product offerings. In the next session, you're about to hear how two technology pioneers, Microsoft and PTC, have partnered to assemble an unparalleled technology portfolio and what that can mean to make digital transformation a reality for your company. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome America's regional lead for manufacturing at Microsoft, David Bria. Great, hi everyone. Big day here in Boston today with game seven when um, the PTC team contacted me to ask if I'd be willing to go onto the big stage. Nowhere in my wildest dreams could I imagine this. Um, that's part, part of the reason we're partners with them is, is being able to design and come up with awesome concepts like this. <clears throat> We've got a lot packed into the next 30 minutes, but um, wanted to share with you Microsoft's perspective on the manufacturing market. Uh, people don't often think of Microsoft as a manufacturing company. So wanted to really talk about what is our strategy, where are we placing big bets, and more importantly, talk about what we're doing with customers and what we've actually done to transform ourselves, and, and then really close with how a partnership between PTC and Microsoft can really help you on your own transformation journey. As you look at the state of the market today, there's a lot of uh, divergent forces that are really coming together. Uh, many of these are well known, right? It's the, the rules of competition that kind of govern manufacturing every day more demanding customers, the, the need for new experience and services. I think what's really different is that um, this is creating a lot of complexity that's hard to comprehend as you go upstream into the supply chains and plants and even uh, engineering functions within companies. What um, I think is equal, equally a challenge is being able to not only deliver this complexity, but being able to do it in shorter times with more precision. What has changed, and we think manufacturing is really at this tipping point, right? Uh, digital transformation has been a discussion. We think there's really uh, a, a catalyst for action that's going to really switch this year. And what's changed in driving that is technology, right? The advent of some of these platforms, some of these new AI-based models, and even the ability to deliver it in, in different ways, not to a laptop or a desktop is really driving um, some of the changes that we see and that have already been delivered at scale. Whether you believe the number is around trillions of dollars of opportunity or not, I think we can all agree that there is a big opportunity that leaders will capitalize on first. The um, other thing that is interesting is you get into IoT and you start seeing data and, and things and people get digitized is the ability to go address um, cost areas that have largely been difficult to manage before. Things like energy and water and even other um, sustainable ideas around circular economies and being to, to not just remanufacture products but almost reconstitute them into your raw material supply chain. What is kind of the dark cloud that's hanging out there is um, the workforce, right? There's a lot of fear when you get down to the worker level that this technology is going to replace jobs. They will be displaced, but the projections show that actually twice as many jobs that will be displaced will be created. And so there's a real opportunity to not just transform the processes, but transform the workforce as well. And we think that's a fundamental enabler to transformation. And then finally, really new risk, right? So as more data gets created and gets put up into this, this cloud, um, this is really the number one item on the C-level agenda. If you think about what every board of directors talks about, it's this cyber risk, and, and people are um, really challenged to figure out how to deal with it. It's six times as big of an impact as the investment levels are right now. So it'll be interesting to see how this changes over time. I, I say that because there's really um, some leadership that is starting to pave the way around how you can get behind some themes and be able to think about driving transformation in, in your own business. 
most factories were built over time, sometimes decades. Um, they weren't given big IT budgets, so when you go and actually look at the way that, that processes work today, there's legacy systems and embedded um, capabilities that kind of generate these islands of data. And so when you um, actually walk the workflow and see how work gets done, it's usually people, paper, and a lot of heroics, right? And that's kind of come to dominate the manufacturing culture. There, there are opportunities to really go after three themes, end-to-end -end engineering, and there's no way I can do justice to what was covered in the keynote yesterday, so if you didn't see it, um, that, that's a beautiful kind of tour of what that end-to-end -end digital uh, experience would look like in, in, in an engineering process that spans a full product life cycle. There's equal opportunity around horizontal integration, so companies that have multiple plants or shared um, suppliers, distribution centers, there's really opportunity to kind of connect, be able to standardize and, and drive comparative performance and share best practices. We think the, the billion dollar value propositions are going to be had through vertical integration. And this is different than the way that it operates today. Um, a lot of these kind of supplier and buyer relationships are dictated by EDI kind of processes. There's really an opportunity to kind of reconstitute the value chain in, in a way that's never been, it's been dreamed about, but it's never been possible before. I think the good news is that you can take off as much of a bite as your ambition allows. You can go after a local initiative, you can try and go look at a plant or a value, value chain, or you can go right into um, new business models. So there's a lot of flexibility, and, and frankly, that's creating a lot of confusion, right? Where do I start? The, the buzzwords that you see <laughs> around these technologies, in some cases, are more innovative than what the capabilities are uh, on their own. So there's a lot of confusion. And, and we're really trying to cut through that and focus on what matters. Part of that perspective is shaped by our customer base. When we talk about manufacturing, it's really diverse. It's everything from companies like Tetra Pak and the food processing and packaging. Um, Shell is considered a, a manufacturing um, resource provider, so subsurface drilling, connecting all the way to filling stations. And companies like JBill that have really transcended um, historical contract manufacturing to really being a leading designer and manufacturer of all kinds of different products, so electronics and more. The, the other thing that um, we do is we attend conferences like this. One that we um, kind of put a big investment in is the Hanover Messe. So if you haven't heard about this, it's the, lar the world's largest industrial trade fair that happens in Hanover, Germany every April. This year there were over 240,000 people so if you've been to big conferences, this one was the biggest I have, uh, I have attended. And you can see at the bottom our booth, there were 52 different showcases of what we're doing with customers and partners today. And I can attest that there was really not even room to turn around. We had 34,000 people per day for the five-day event. The coolest thing was, for me was the startup showcase. So we actually had nine um, companies come up and talk about how they're building their business on Microsoft technology. So to me, that was really a high point. Another thing that we um, were fortunate to participate in is this, this study by the World Economic Forum. So if you've seen that, it's a multi-year study where they walked thousands of plants and identified what they call 16 lighthouse factories. Um, the criteria was essentially the ability to deploy these industry 4.0 principles at scale and deliver step change improvement. What, um, to me, was more revealing is what wasn't found. So as you look at those 16 factories, they cross different industry boundaries. They were both big and small companies, and the locations were in emerging markets as well as more established areas. The one thing that was a common thread was that rather than trying to go in focused on productivity and cost reduction, these companies embraced their workforce. While they did optimize, they really went in with a growth agenda. So they were focused on how do they drive revenue and margin and, and really be able to enter adjacent markets. And the forward-looking projections kind of prove that out. The, um, over the next two to three years, the projection is the companies that can really deploy these AI-enabled cloud technologies at scale have the ability to increase their cash flow by 120 plus percent. Those that wait, like literally two years later, are going to have the ability to improve their cash flow by 
So there's almost like a scale or a magnitude around speed that's driven by the competitive advantage that these, these technologies offer. You don't want to see the numbers of the laggards, right? Those are negative. So a lot of this has really informed um, the way that we think about the market. If you think about Microsoft, um, we've been going through our own transformation. When Satya, our CEO, took over that role four years ago, his number one priority was to change the culture. And he and the leadership team worked really hard to remove any barriers to innovation. <clears throat> what that's done is really been able to allow us to move from kind of siloed product organization structures to almost tilting the company sideways and really focus on vertical markets. Manufacturing is one of those, right? That's a critical area for Microsoft, and it's an area that um, we've been able to invest in, but we're not there yet. Part of what's going to guide our path going forward are the three leadership principles. So if you've seen Satya's book, Hit Refresh, he basically outlines a strategy. The three leadership principles are around bringing clarity, so cutting through the noise and focusing on what matters, being able to generate energy, so kind of coming in with that digital mindset and being able to bring in various thoughts and ideas and getting people excited uh, about the journey, but most importantly, making things happen, right? And doing that with a sense of urgency and speed um, to drive impact, right? Not just turning technology on. If you look at um, where we're really placing our bets in manufacturing, it shouldn't be a surprise based on what I just said. Number one is empowering the workforce. Two is being able to deliver new services and where appropriate, monetizing them, right? There's an opportunity to create new revenue streams. The classic manufacturing um, mindset around optimizing digital operations, but this is a combination of factory of the future and intelligent supply chains. So it's kind of bringing some of these trends together in a different way, a new operating model, if you will. And then really kind of the transformation around reimagining your brand, really thinking about what is your value proposition to your own customers? There's this concept of tech, in tech intensity. So Microsoft is a platform company. We provide productivity services. But tech intensity is about really building the capabilities and tools to allow every company to become a software company. There's two key tenets to that. One is making sure that world-class technology is available when you need it. And more importantly, that you're not investing to kind of recreate things that have already been developed. The, the second piece of that is really um, a human capital investment. So the way that these technologies work is very different than the way that technology has been acquired and deployed in the past, right? Microsoft was a product company focused on PCs, on desks. <laughs> now we're a solutions company going deep into industry verticals. And so when you think about platforms, you think about emerging technologies that haven't been productized, and even some of the new things that we're offering with partners like PTC, there's a different engagement model required. It really um, is all about continuous innovation and delivery versus running to a go live and then going to the next thing on your list. So the big shift is really around, um, this is a very simplified version of the architecture of the future, it consists of the intelligent cloud connected to the intelligent edge. The intelligent cloud is a global footprint of data centers around the world that um, are real-time connected to the various, really the ever-expanding set of systems and devices at the edge. And this will continue to, to operate, operate that way for many years to come. We talk about this ubiquitous computing fabric. So basically, it extends from the cloud to the edge, and it gives you the ability to figure out where you want to put these capabilities. Is it close to the action at the edge, where the data is created? Where do you store it? Where do you process it? Most importantly, how do you drive action, right? So there's lots of different options, and that's basically our commitment to, um, to our customer base and the manufacturing industry at large. This is a massive level of investment. Um, two million kilometers of fiber optic cable connect 50 regions around the world. There's 72 terabytes per second that go through our backbone. And we've even got sovereign clouds in Germany and, and China where the government you know, has more, um, more restrictive type of uh, 
<clears throat> type of parameters around how you can operate the cloud. A couple innovations that I wanted to share. So in our quest to achieve more, this is something called Product Natic. So this is one of the many data centers around the world. What's different about this one is that it's submerged. It literally sits at the bottom of the ocean. And it has already delivered on our performance objectives, but it's actually delivered unintended benefits around um, security, around resiliency, and even environmental benefits, if you can believe that. If you look at the edge, we see a hole in the market. And so we've made some investments. We're back in the chip business. And this is an um, offering called Azure Sphere. It's basically a chip-based solution. We believe it will reset performance, um, cost, and security benchmarks. It's actually some of this technology is taken from our investments in gaming systems. And it's really a way that you can deploy IoT at a cheaper way, let it stand up and sit there for years to come without ever having to go rewire it or, or upgrade it and, and, um, and change it out. So I mean, who could have thought Microsoft could do this five years ago? One of the core things that we operate on is the concept of trust. As more data gets created and pushed to the cloud, um, manufacturers can't afford for their mission-critical processes to go down. right? And we hear that every time we, we have a discussion around the cloud. <laughs> There's really four key, four key principles when we think about trust, and we think this is a differentiator in terms of how we go to market. Um, security is really around making sure that we keep your data secure. We spend a billion dollars a year on this and intercept um, five billion malware where, where threats a month. Um, privacy, making sure that your data is private, it's under your control, and you know what we're doing with it. So this GDPR European regulation is something that we've deployed globally, so we take it very serious. Transparency is about really knowing what we're doing with your data. We publish documents and tools so you know what, what the data is, and we're not going to release it to anybody um, without your direct authorization. And then compliance is really making sure that, that um, you're in accordance with the law. A recent survey showed that um, almost one out of two executives don't even know what the regulations are that you need to be in compliance with. So we manage over 70 globally and many, many more at a regional and local level. So let me kind of get to, to the chase here. Um, I want to go through each one of these offerings and give you a flavor for our point of view. I think we've got unique capabilities. We think there's a differentiated value prop, and we've built the right partner ecosystem to deliver this fast and at scale. That's a little bit different than, than what we see when we go in um, with companies that have kind of started this journey, but they're either stuck or haven't designed for scale up front. So We've talked a lot about the, the challenge with the workforce. As we look at um, employees across different enterprises, especially in manufacturing, Microsoft's been delivering productivity tools to the white collar workforce, a lot of these roles on the left, um, for a long time. And it's actually driven some pretty significant gains from the old days when work got done with paper and telephones and fax machines. That still exists um, in non-white collar type areas, and so the core for us is really focusing on the individual. It's almost looking at the specific roles and the skill sets of the people in those roles. This concept of frontline workers, in some companies, these are your most valuable employees. Right? These are the people that engage your customers. They represent your brands. They actually interact with your products and services in the field. And so they're basically the face of the company. They're roughly two billion strong. and our mobile first strategy is really around focusing on devices versus desktops. These people often don't go to an office. They don't have a computer. They may not even have an individual workspace. And so you know, the concepts that, that we've seen today are quite different when you engage with these folks. So we've got a full set of capabilities around skill enhancement, task management, process improvement, and then broader um, workforce enablement. AI is having a big impact in this role. This is kind of a scary thing because it changes almost weekly. The way that I think about it is really um, in manufacturing, it has the potential to humanize manufacturing, kind of take the robots out of people, right, and repurpose people to do what they're uniquely capable to do. Complex thinking, ideation, communications with others, rather than you know, sitting on assembly lines doing the same thing over and over again. 
So a good example of this is um, what we're doing with a company called BAE Systems. They use the PTC and Microsoft suite to create guided instructions for workers around a new battery product. They make um, basically green propulsion systems for buses that run through a lot of the cities today. So let me let you hear it in their own words. There's huge growth in this market, but it is unsustainable unless we embrace new technology. BAE Systems is committed to solving the most complex problems our customers have. Here at BAE Systems, we make the electric propulsion for hybrid drive buses. Our production tempo has increased dramatically. We brought on a lot of new people. That's forced us to look at innovative solutions to build product correctly every time. How do we do that? How did we do that? Is with mixed reality. When I first tried a HoloLens, I quickly understood that this technology would have significant implications for our business and that we needed to get out in front of it. We had to find a platform that could help us scale, and that's when we began the conversations with PTC. PTC's mission is to bridge the physical and the digital world, whether it's manufacturing, operating, or servicing physical products. We came along and we had a mixed reality solution to allow them to create experiences for the HoloLens quicker and more efficiently. It's all drag and drop. You don't need a lot of technical expertise. You get up and running right away. It just makes it a lot faster and easier to get a lot of people using the experiences that were created with our software. PTC's mixed reality solution has allowed us to drag and drop our 3D models that we already have to create battery work instructions to deliver to our production floor in hours and at a tenth of the cost. We develop a step-by-step -step guide that lets the assembler completely assemble the battery. You're not looking at this in two dimensions anymore on a screen that's far away from you. It's right in front of you. The HoloLens has really become beneficial in allowing us to train new people on this product 30 to 40 percent more efficiently. Using the HoloLens, I was able to cut my assembly time in half. We can understand and we can learn so much faster, efficiently, feel a part of this process. Microsoft has really nailed it with the HoloLens platform, and PTC is helping us scale this affordably across the enterprise. 20 years ago, we didn't have personal computers on every bench. 10 years ago, we didn't have 3D printers. Now I can't imagine building without those. And I think this is what the HoloLens represents. It's the next step in the evolution of high-tech manufacturing. The future of mixed reality is really exciting because the possibilities are endless. We're just starting to scratch the surface of it. It really is endless what we're gonna be able to do and where we can go. This is gonna help us get there. So 30 to 40% more productive in training, cutting assembly time and half that doesn't even talk to the quality aspects, right? One, one example. This is actually a good entree point to the digital thread, right? The way that um, products look across the life cycle gets influenced by engineering way up front. As a former en engineer, I remember when the launch date sat out there and you try to keep a lot of the, the knowledge, the specifications, the blueprints, the designs captive until that date and then the launch becomes like an enterprise event and everybody's scram scrambling down the line. Um, even today, there's still problems with bomb synchronization, being able to really cascade changes and really align the organization around what, what's needed at each, each stage of the process. I think the first step is really getting connectivity. If you look at these different points, this is where we see people trying to tie in IoT to products all the way through end of life cycle. Um, this concept of having the product be the voice of the customer w rather than waiting for customer complaints to come through a call center is pretty novel. You know, moving forward, it's really connecting this real time and more importantly, closing the loop so engineers can see what these products are doing in the field so that as they develop the next iteration or generation of products, um, all of that gets fed together. So another example um, is Tetra Pak. I, I talked about that. If you don't know Tetra Pak, you know their juice boxes. They make 188 billion of them and supply them to 170 countries per year. Uh, their vision is milk as a service, and the challenge is cows can't wait. The vision of Tetra Pak is to provide food safe and available everywhere. 
Tetra Pak is a supplier of processing and packaging solutions to the liquid food industry. Digital is important because it allows us to develop completely new values to customers and deliver existing values in a much more efficient way as well. With IoT and advanced analytics of data, there are huge opportunities. Currently, we monitor more than 600 alarms in one single machine, which provide regular performance data to us, which is somewhere around six, 700 million data points in one year. So every day in real time, we get data from our customers. When you're in liquid food manufacturing, milk doesn't last forever, of course. So when you have 50,000 liters of milk and your machine doesn't run, you have to fix it quickly we can now proactively support our customers with predicting things and preventing failures actually before they happen at our customer sites, which saves the customer a lot of money and increases the uptime of their equipment. While we're trying really hard to predict issues, sometimes when there's problems, we send a system specialist to site. That is very time consuming. What we can do with the Microsoft HoloLens in real time, the system specialist can sit thousands of miles away, remotely supporting the service engineer who wears these uh, Microsoft HoloLens glasses. The relationship between Microsoft and Tetra Pak is very complementary. Microsoft takes a holistic approach to our business. And every conversation we have always starts from our challenges or our opportunities. It doesn't start from products or solutions. I think the future is very bright for Tetra Pak services. So I love the comment that you know every discussion starts with challenges and opportunities. There, there are many. Um, Microsoft has many products. We can kill you <laughs> with demos, right? And we can come in and do the product parade. That's really a good way um, as you think about digitizing your own operations in terms of what's changed in our engagement model. What, what hasn't changed are really the objectives around manufacturing, right? These things are pretty cemented. What's new is the technology that can enable it. And so AI often gets talked about as this kind of magical thing. Um, we like to unpack it and really talk about the capabilities, right? The capabilities around object and speech recognition, being able to look at patterns at a very deep level and, and optimize around, you know, sometimes hundreds of variables is really what the technology does. So what we try to do is bring our knowledge of AI-specific capabilities into different scenarios. The real breakthrough you know, in, in plants is being able to take that down to a micro level so that you're planning, executing, and getting real-time feedback at a work cell, at a piece of equipment, at a person level. And so that's really the, the opportunity within um, what we call the factory of the future. There's multiple scenarios that go into the vision of a factory of the future, but most of your factories are different, so it's hard to say, Here's, here's the solution until we go in and, and work together to figure that out. A good example of this is JBill. Um, they are a leading contract manufacturer, probably one of the best in the world at building circuit boards. They had a unique opportunity, which was they built a new plant, they had a chance to greenfield. And so when they brought in the equipment, it was lit up with all kinds of sensors and data, and they started to um, work with Microsoft to be able to apply machine learning. There was a simple problem, which was, how do we understand upstream machine conditions so that we can prevent them before the circuit boards get soldered and, and tested? It's really hard to rework and, and um, reconstitute some of the things that go into these circuit boards. <clears throat> they were able to deliver 17% savings. 10% energy cost savings, but 17% savings on, on the way that they were operating this brand new circuit board assembly line and a brand new plant. So um, as a double E, that, those numbers are stunning, right? So imagine what you could do in, in more of a brownfield situation. As you look outside the walls of the factory and think about macro scenarios, where you can take the same kind of plan, do, report, loop, and look at it across the supply chain. Um, again, supply chain's always been about synchronizing financial, physical, and information flows, and being able to kind of clear supply and demand points at different parts of a network. The way that um, companies operate today, I think it's the average has 15 to 23 different supply chains that most companies have to manage, but they're still using one system and one process to do it. So similar to what I said in factories, 
There's a lot of fingers. There's a lot of spreadsheets. There's a lot of um, process disconnects. Similarly, a lot of companies have deployed on-prem applications designed to fit very functional purposes. And so they get this cascading kind of set of processes that impose constraints on each other. The, the net result is it's really hard to optimize the entire network. And as a former supply chain guy, what was even harder is getting data to feed the planning engines. And so if you can kind of think about doing that across an entire value chain, not just within the enterprise end to end, and literally being able to optimize at the push of a button, those are things well in sight today. It will take time to get there, but it's a fundamentally different philosophy around supply chain. Part of what has informed that thinking is um, our own business. So Microsoft sells things like the HoloLens, Surface, um, gaming systems. So we're in the consumer electronics business. It's a pretty brutal business, right? Very fickle um, consumer demand. There's a lot of requests for personalization. Services are becoming part of the portfolio. And we do it with subcontractors, so a virtualized, very um, kind of complicated network, both inbound and outbound. <clears throat> when we looked at what it was going to take to be competitive, we very quickly recognized that the way that we were operating our supply chain was inadequate, and that traditional optimization techniques, Lean Six Sigma value chain mapping, that was not good enough. We needed to kind of fundamentally rethink the way that that operating model um, would look in the future. It really started with getting connected so we could get visibility end to end and go in and drive some optimization. The, the um, savings that we made around yield and, and scrap were pretty significant. Two was being able to digitize some of these workflows so we could fill the blind spots um, and kind of replace fingertips and spreadsheets with data. That drove massive working capital reduction. And then really being able to get to the transformation stage where we could start to trust not just the data, but some of the planning engines and almost put things into autonomous mode. I think the quote from um, our CVP that runs this division is that it's really allowed the people to focus their time on complex problems and let the computers take care of the day-to-day -day business. Very fundamental shift in terms of how we go to market. Hopefully that showed up in some of our products <laughs> um, if you use them at home. So let me um, kind of close with a couple of points. There's an opportunity to not just drive operational savings, productivity improvements, and other cost reductions. There's really an opportunity to fundamentally rethink your business, right? And kind of thinking beyond the use case and really thinking about how do you reimagine what things would look like in the future, right? That's what it's going to take to stay a step ahead of your customers, but more importantly, a step ahead of um, of your competitors. That's a big part of why we partnered with PTC, is you look at our core um, vision, the principles, the way that we go to market. You know, there's kind of a natural fit in terms of that philosophy. When you extend it down to the products and solutions that we bring together, it's pretty powerful. And if you look at their big bets, there's, it's no mistake that they line up very much with our big bets, right? The words are a little twisted and a little different, but very much aligned around what the vision is and what the capabilities are to drive value. The, um, the other thing that, that I would say is that we're better together. We're not naive. We're not going to go try to rewrite CAD systems and PLL, PLM systems in the cloud. Um, we're going to work with industry leaders that have been doing that for a long time. The commitment that was made um, a year ago is already paying off. I think this was something that was featured. Uh, Microsoft named PTC the partner of the year for manufacturing and for mixed reality, and a finalist for Internet of Things. So this is more than talk. Like, we're actually making this happen. As you think about your own journey, um, like I said, there's, we go in and see a lot of people kind of tinkering, <laughs> playing with lab experiments, or, or they've delivered a good POC and they're stuck because they haven't designed for scale. So our philosophy is really trying to make sure that you focus on what do you do? So that clarity that we talk about. So take a digital first mind mindset and really define where are you going? What are the outcomes that you want to deliver? And that really helps align the organization on a shared vision. Being able to narrow that down to where do you focus? So don't just prioritize opportunities on value. 
but look at organizational readiness and most importantly, time to value. Being able to establish credibility in this journey is really critical. And so building that roadmap, right? The roadmap that goes beyond the first POC that's defined by outcomes, not just go live dates. And then the how. Too often, everybody wants to jump to the how, right? They have a good idea and they want to go right to the how. So take the time to really think about the first two and then the how will kind of take care of itself. It's more than technology. In this concept of governance, there's project level governance for sure, but almost a higher level transformation governance around what is the work to do? Are we delivering results? And how are we going to allocate capital and most, most importantly, resources, right? Time is the most important asset in most manufacturing companies today. And if you haven't been through a transformation before, it is quite different than a typical IT project or even a continuous improvement project. So lean on experts till you're ready, ready to, uh, to do it yourself. Even though every journey is different and every company starts from a different place, most of these transformation roadmaps kind of manifest in three horizons. One is we've got to get connected. Let's leverage the data and the assets that we have. And let's try to take a different kind of a view of our business and go fix things that become apparent that maybe we're relied on um, with gut instinct or after the fact analysis. Trying to make that real time and predictive, this is where you can start opportunistically um, going after different AI use cases, being able to move things to the cloud where either performance and scale provides an advantage to the edge. And then really making sure that you don't stop there, right? Rethinking how these different technologies can put to be put together in combination in the right sequence to create a new operating model. And that's where the breakthrough really happens, right? These are typically ROI positive, self-funding um, horizons. So you can almost think of them as different phases. But the breakthroughs typically happen when you're wrapping up phase two and getting into phase three. So again, our philosophy, think big, start small, go fast, between PTC and Microsoft. We can meet you wherever you are in the journey. but. I would say that it really requires collaborative engagement. It's probably a different way to um, interact with Microsoft, I can attest, than, than what you've been familiar in the past. As part of this, um, and really our commitment to manufacturing, the author that wrote the Hit Refresh book just um, worked with my boss, Charlie and Arkin, who runs Manufacturing and Resources Globally, to um, do the second edition. This is focused specifically on manufacturing in what companies are doing with AI. So I barely scratched the surface. I gave you three um, examples. They're good ones. If you want to get into the details and understand not only what companies have done, but how they're mobilizing to get it done, it really goes into some really interesting um, examples. This is available free for download. So um, go out to LinkedIn or go out to Bing and type in the name of the book, and it's available for download. It's not too long, but there's some really uh, richness in that. So with that, I thank you. I look forward to working with you. And um, with BTC, we can make it get done faster.